Well, good morning, Bear Swamp Baptist Church, and in fact, whoever might be watching and listening out on the internet. Uh, my name is David Morgan. I'm the pastor at Bear Swamp Baptist Church. And as far as I know, this is our very first live stream, uh, 235 years in the making. And so I, I welcome you to this broadcast. And uh, I've got a couple of announcements I want to kind of start off with. Um, if you could, I noticed that there are people already liking and commenting. Uh, that helps me to know that the video quality is okay and that uh, the sound is coming through and all those types of things. So uh, if, if you want to continue making comments, um, this is a little bit different. <laughs> and I have to say, uh, admit, this feels kind of weird uh, preaching to my laptop. Uh, but um, let's make it interactive as much as we can. I saw somebody made a comment that uh, coffee on Sunday mornings might have to turn into a new thing. I hope you have a cup of coffee. I've got mine right here, my, my Cowboys mug. I've got my water. Um, I might look dressed up, but I'm, I'm not wearing my fancy shoes today. So uh, we're all in this together. And this is, this is different. This coronavirus has, uh, or whatever it is you want to call it, has kind of flipped the world on its head. But we're going to get this through this together. Um, we're going to have prayer after a couple of minutes. And one thing I would like for you to do, if you have a prayer request and you want to add it um, to, the, to the comments, um, go ahead and do that. And I'll try uh, to include the prayer requests that come through. Hopefully I'll see it. Uh, if for some reason you can't comment on the Facebook, uh, on the, on the uh, broadcast, you can text me at 843-256-6048. Um, you know, the reality is this could be the first of several weeks like this. We hope not, uh, but we're not. I don't think next Sunday is even going to be through the 15-day recommended window of uh, small gatherings and so we might have to get used to this so what I would like for you to do is um, make any mental notes maybe even jot them down about how this could be improved whether it be color uh, video quality uh, sound quality <laughs> I need to close my bathroom with the door hold on <laughs> oh I knew it wouldn't go perfectly. Um, so anyway, this might be the first of two or three times that we have to do this. And so if you could um, make a comment or you know, send me an email or have a conversation with me, let me know uh, what it could be, how, how it could be improved. So um, this is different. Well, let's, uh, let's start with a song. And we're going to start with, um, well, let's make some announcements first. Um, okay, so I have first that Men of Courage is tonight. I checked with James. That is actually not going to happen uh, just because we're trying to, uh, you know, comply with what, whatever the government is asking of us right now. So we're not going to be having Men of Courage tonight um, at James's house. Um, something that I think is important for all of us to remember is that even though we're not meeting together at church right now, the needs of the church still go on. And this, I hate to say this, it feels kind of self-serving. Obviously, my salary depends on this, but also um, the light bill at the church, the power bill, um, all the, you know, all the other costs that accrue, they're going to keep accruing for right now. So if you could continue your normal giving, at this time. That would be a true blessing. And if for some reason you're not able to work and your income has been um, eaten into because of this uh, situation, we understand that. And uh, you just be as faithful as the Lord allows. If, and this is capital I-F, if um, things don't change, or if things change and we're able to get back to normal, um, our Easter egg hunt is going to be on the 11th, and the next day, Easter Sunday, we have a sunrise service. Of course, all this is up in the air, um, which includes VBS in June. We don't know 
if it's going to get back to normal by then. But uh, just in case, we're going to uh, announce those things. And so if you have any questions, um, feel free to let me know and uh, we'll, we'll get those announcements taken care of. Let's pray real quick and then we'll sing a song together. Father in heaven, we love you. And uh, in these strange times, we give this hour to you. We worship um, together, but separately. And Father, whatever it is that you would like to teach us through this um, pandemic, this illness, whatever it is that it is that you're doing, help us to learn the lesson and to learn it quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing a song called uh, No Longer Slaves. Now, don't make me sing a solo. If you know this song, sing out. Of course, I won't hear you. Um, I put the very first comment. There wasn't a way for me to include it in the video description, but the very first comment um, was a comment by me. And it has the lyrics to this song in it. Or you could look it up yourself on another device or whatever. And, uh, well, let's just try it together, okay? It's going to be in this key. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a child. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Father, I am surrounded 
I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I hope you were able to sing along with me, and uh, let's uh, let's go to the next phase here. I'm going to see if uh, we have any prayer requests. All right, <laughs> y'all y'all are funny. Y'all make some funny comments. Got some unspoken's, the, you know, all the stuff that's going on with the coronavirus, of course, uh, the medical field. You know that's a good one teachers and students who are having to um, you know their, their life is turned upside down right now a lot of you are homeschooling now now you know how, what my wife feels like all the time <laughs> all right let's see let's see all right well let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, let's try to remember what we can and you pray with me father in heaven uh, we are so grateful that we're able to gather together um, <laughs> We're not together, but we are. We're united in spirit, if not in the flesh. And uh, we are reminded that even if some of us are fearful, we're not slaves to fear. Um, you are in control and you are still good. And we ask uh, that your watch care over us would be everlasting. Father, um, we thank you first of all for Jesus who died for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Um, we ask that you would be a special blessing to those who are sick, whether they have uh, this disease or not, maybe they have something else. We ask that you would continue to uh, watch over them, be gracious to them. Father, for those whose lives are being um, severely impacted by this, um, those in the medical community who are probably working overtime, those who might be producing medical equipment, our, um, our elected leaders, of course, are, um, are really working overtime right now. We ask that you give them wisdom. We ask that you would give them strength. We ask that those that are believers would continue to trust in you. Uh, Father, for our teachers and students and those who are now uh, teaching from home, it's just a world of difference. And we ask that you would give parents patience that you would give uh, kids the, the, the mindset and the character to be obedient and respectful of their parents during this difficult and trying time. Father, we give all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, maybe, maybe let's sing a song that's maybe a little more familiar to many of you. And it's called I'll Fly away and uh, you know when we're when we're in situations like we are right now um, many people are reminded that this is this life is fleeting um, and of course as Christians we know this uh, but uh, what do we have to look forward to well we have this to look forward to we'll fly away one day some glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away shall never end I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die hallelujah by and by I'll fly away when I die hallelujah by and by 
singing, everybody. Good singing. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> um, I hope you have your Bible. Where did speaking of Bibles, where did mine go? Well, there it is. Okay. Uh, we're not going to be looking at any one particular passage today. However, see, I just touched my face. Rule number one: shouldn't do that. Um, we're still together studying God's Word and what it says. Um, in fact, what I want to talk about today is, you know, the coronavirus and every all the ramifications of it have us thinking about illness, right, on a grand scale. Uh, you might have heard the word pandemic. Um, and, you know, I have, as I scroll social media and pay attention to the news, I've heard lots of people, and this is correct, saying, we should have fear in times like this, not faith. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. We should have faith, not fear. Faith, not fear. And I've heard it said that faith is the opposite of fear. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And so I almost brought a message about that. But I thought, you know what? There are plenty of people speaking to that issue. And you've probably seen um, something like that. And so I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. Um, there is, uh-oh, I think we're having some trouble with the connection. Let me see. I'm going to just, okay. I'm just going to give this a second. We'll do the best we can. I'm just going to keep preaching, and we'll see uh, what happens. Um, the age-old question, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? You've probably heard um, that, that question posed. And so one of the things that we have to understand is the nature of God. God is so God is sovereign, right? That means God is in control of everything. Um, Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. That means even when we're experiencing illness, right? Who's ultimately in control of that? Well, God is. And so when we, uh, when we, the first thing we need to do when we're peeling back this onion is understand and commit to this truth. That God is sovereign. No matter what happens, no matter how bad it is, no matter how painful it is, uh, God is in control. But there's a second uh, quality of God. It's in His nature that we need to commit to, and that is that God is good. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. And if you will taste of Him and see, you would see that He is is good. So no matter what is happening, no matter how good or how bad, God is in control of that, first of all. But number two, He is good. In other words, even when we see something like this happening, the, the COVID-19, the, the Wuhan flu, whatever you want to call it, um, God is in control of it, yes. But is God good? through it. Yes, he is. And so instead of necessarily going down this rabbit hole of why does God allow bad things to happen to good people, which is an entirely different sermon, I want to tackle this question. It's a twist on that question. What good is God accomplishing through the coronavirus? 
if God is in control and God is good, then that means he is accomplishing something good through this. And I want us to explore that together. And not just this illness for that matter. What are you going through? What, what cancer is in your family? Diabetes, um, surgeries, right on, right on down the line. Is God in control? Yes. What good is he accomplishing through these things? And so I want to uh, bring up three points, three point sermon. Um, and number one is that God is punishing the wicked. Now that sounds harsh. <laughs> Uh, I, I am under no illusions that that sounds really bad. But um, it's true. And I want to talk with you about it. I want to talk with you about it. If you have any questions, you can put them in the comments. I'll try to answer any questions. Uh, let's clear up some misconceptions first about illness and sickness in general. Um, some people might say, isn't sickness just a natural part of life? Isn't it just a natural part of life? We get, you know, part of living in this world is we get sick. Um, I've never known a person that didn't get sick at least once. Uh, my grandfather, the one who passed away three years ago, he told me uh, before he died that he only had one headache that he ever remembered in his entire life, which I found amazing because I have headaches all the time. But anyway, um, isn't, just, isn't it a natural thing to be sick in this world? And um, I think of Yoda. <laughs> Sorry to go geeky on you. But I think of Yoda from The Empire Strikes Back when he said, death is a natural part of life. Or maybe it was Revenge of the Sith. I think it was Revenge of the Sith. Anyway, he said, death is a natural part of life. And I remember the first time I saw that in the theater, I wanted to stand up and shout, no, it's not. It's not. Um... Death began with the fall, Adam's sin. And so sickness began with the fall, with Adam's sin. And so that's the first misconception I want to clear up real quickly, is that um, the reason sometimes we feel like we're being punished uh, when we go through an illness or when we go through a difficult time is because there's a certain element of truth to that. Think about it. If Adam had not sinned, would we experience sickness, loss, depravity? No, we wouldn't experience any of those things. So in one respect, all pain is a natural um, outworking of sin. I mean, we know the verse, uh, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what's the next step on that Romans road? Um the wages of sin is death. And before death usually comes illness and sickness and pain. And so um, one thing that God is accomplishing, I'm not, first of all, I'm not saying that all illness is a result of God's punishment. That is not at all what I'm saying. Um, but I am saying that one of the things, one of the good things that God, I forgot to put my title up there, one of the good things that God, you can't even read it. I'm going to take it down. One of the good things that God is accomplishing is that he is punishing the wicked. And, you know, he talks about this. Um, before the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan, two different times he warned them. He said, if you will not listen to me, this is Leviticus 26, 14 through 16. He said, if you will not listen to me and do all these commandments... But if you break my covenant, this I will do to you. I will visit you with panic. Now, take a look around. This country's going through a panic. Now, I'm not saying that America is analogous to Israel, but I'm saying God's character doesn't change, right? And when people as a whole in mass reject God's covenant, reject God's laws, which we certainly have done as a nation, God says, I'm going to send panic. He says, I will visit you with wasting disease. In other words, God is saying that when people disobey him, he will visit them with punishment. And one of those punishments 
is disease. He said basically the same thing in Deuteronomy chapter 28, right before they went into the land. And, you know, these were not idle threats. Um, we saw him do it in the Old Testament. Uh, remember the ten plagues that he sent on Egypt? Now, one of them, at least, was an illness, boils on the flesh. Um, two different times he used plagues, that is, physical illness, sickness, um, to kill 14,000 people, Numbers chapter 16, verse 49, and then 24,000 people he killed, uh, the wicked of Israel, in Numbers chapter 25 and verse 9. God takes it very seriously, and he uses illnesses to punish people, the wicked. Uh, there was a wicked king of Israel named Jehoram, and uh, if you look at Second Chronicles 21, 15, I'm going to flip over there. Um, in Second Chronicles 21, the Bible says he was very wicked. He walked in the ways of his wicked fathers. And the, the Bible says, listen to this. In chapter 21 and verse 15, um, Elisha speaking to him says, You yourself will have a severe sickness with the disease of your bowels. <laughs> Sounds like Ebola or something like that, until your bowels come out because of the disease day by day. That sounds incredibly painful, incredibly disgusting. Sounds a lot like what happened to people in an Ebola virus. Um, he did that in the, in the Old Testament, but it's not just something in the Old Testament. Um, we see it happening in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 12, for example, uh, one of the Herods was wicked, and it says, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne. This is Acts chapter 12, verses 21 through 23. He delivered an oration, and the people were shouting, the voice of a God, not of a man. They were worshiping him, basically. And it says, and immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. This is some kind of... Um, disease of the intestines, almost certainly. And so God punishing the wicked right there in the New Testament. In other words, some people will say, oh yeah, God did that in the Old Testament, but not in the New. Oh yeah, in the New. In Revelation chapter 2, uh, John, through the Holy Spirit, is writing and Jesus is dictating to John some letters to seven churches. And he says um, to one of the churches, he says, behold, he's talking about a false teacher that he calls Jezebel. He goes, I will throw her onto a sick bed. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent. In other words, they were being wicked. And so he says, I will make them sick. And so we see this happening even in the New Testament. And then you look into the future. In Revelation chapter 9, um, you know, the tribulation, it's called the tribulation for good reason. It is not going to be fun. Um, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 18, it says, By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. He says, by these plagues, that is different illnesses of different kinds, God is going to kill. Uh, think about this. We, we are freaking out as a society, as an international community, over what? coronavirus is, is and it, you know, it is killing people. No question about it. But there's going to come a day when God, through three different plagues, basically at the same time, it's not going to take long, is going to kill 33% of all humanity. That is amazing. And so, here's the question. How can we understand God's punishment of the wicked as good. I think Christians, for the most part, by and large, have a pretty clear understanding that God's um, punishment is necessary because He's holy, because He's just, because He does right. But we're, we're sort of reluctant. We sort of say, yeah, I don't like it, but God has to do this. But hold on. If God is always good, then punishing the wicked is good. So I want to ask how. So uh, let me do this by sharing an illustration. Um, does a government? Let me ask a question first. Does a government 
uh, reward evildoers. When, when we hear about people like the person who uh, committed the Pulse nightclub shooting a couple years ago, or um, Jeffrey Dahmer back in the 90s. You might recall Jeffrey Dahmer was a guy who, um, through homosexual activity, uh, lured young men into his apartment, killed them, and then uh, did unspeakable things to them. I think there might be children watching, so I, you know I, I'm going to um, gloss over some of the details. These are bad guys. And if our government is fair, right? If our government is, let's use this word, good, then our government will uphold laws in such a way that evildoers are punished, right? If somebody broke into your home, uh, men, and uh, did unspeakable things to your wife and your kids, how would you feel if the government just said, well, that's the first time he's done it. He said he's sorry. He won't do it again. We'll let him off the hook. How would you feel about that? If you have any sense of justice, if you're a normal person, you would say, that's not right. The government has to do something. This person must be punished. You don't have to take glee in it, but you have to recognize that it's the good thing to do. Well, here's a question. Why is God any different? If God is holy, then he must up, up, hold up his standard of holiness and righteousness. And humanity is born in sin. We rush headlong into sin. And God must punish. Not only must he punish, it's the right thing to do. It is good that he punishes the wicked. So the, the better question is, since God is good, how can he save anybody? Really, that's the better question. And of course, we know that the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to implore you, if you're watching today, or if you're watching this as a recording later, because it will be up as a recording, understand that even though God is good and he will punish you for your wickedness, he also is good, and He loves you. And He loves you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for your sins. He did this not because you're good, not because you're all warm and cuddly and fuzzy and He just had to do it. No, He does it out of His own gracious nature, out of His own goodness, out of His own commitment to save His creation. And so if you're still lost and in darkness, under the punishment of God. Maybe not through COVID-19, maybe not through the Chinese flu, but through something else. Remember, this is not just about what's going on with coronavirus. This is about every bad thing that happens. Why is it happening? If you're outside of the grace of God and you're not in Christ, perhaps God is trying to send you a message. Perhaps he is leveling some measure of punishment on you to wake you up, to turn you around and say, this has to change. You must come to me. You must trust in my son and be forgiven of your sins. So that is one of the things I think that God is doing through this coronavirus and through all bad things that happen is I think that one of the good things he is doing, we need to recognize it and acknowledge it as good that God is punishing the wicked. But there's a second thing that God is doing and that he is purging the righteous. God is purging the righteous. Did you know that even um, righteous people, when I say righteous people, I mean saved people. Um, the Bible says that Job was a righteous man. And when, when you read the account of Job, you don't see a lot of righteousness there. And yet the book of Hebrews tells us that he was righteous, which means he put his faith in Yahweh, and in the promised deliverer that was coming. Um, and what that means is that even if you are righteous before God, that is, you are saved, we don't always live righteously, do we? In fact, David said in Psalm 38, 
chapter, th uh, chapter 38, verse 3, he says, There is no soundness in my flesh. I'm sick. I'm sick. Because of your indignation. Now, this is, this is pretty heavy for us because we live in a culture that says God is always pleased with you. God is always, um, God is always happy with you. And I would say, in one respect, God is always pleased with you. Positionally, in Christ, God is always pleased with you. But uh, sanctificationally, I don't think I just made up a word, but when we sin, is God pleased with that? I think the obvious answer is no. Jesus died for those sins, right? Jesus died for those sins. And so David says, because of your indignation, I have no soundness in my flesh. I am sick. Uh, David experienced, he said right after that, there is no health in my bones because of my sin. Have you ever been actively engaged in what you knew was a sinful lifestyle and you knew it was making you sick? Maybe not physically even, maybe emotionally. Um, I do know that uh, oftentimes emotional stress comes through with physical distress. Um, upset stomach, heart palpitations and fluttering, migraine headaches. When we're, and by the way, once again, I want to, I want to stress that I'm not saying that all illness is a result of, of wicked choices. But when we're making wicked choices, I don't think we should be surprised if we're visited by illness, by stress, by emotional fatigue, by these types of things. You see, God expects His people to be like Him, to be holy. Um, this should not be a surprise, church. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Paul says to Timothy, there is a certain way that people in the church ought to behave. He says, in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that we say when we go to the church building is that we're going to God's house is because of this verse. Paul says that the, house, the church is the household of God, and there is a certain way that we ought to behave, which means there's certain ways we ought not to behave as well. Um, last week, the teens did a very good job of breaking down uh, the difference between um, living by the flesh and living by the Spirit. And, uh, sorry, I had somebody message me, and they shouldn't be doing that. I'm trying to preach a sermon. Um, they did a great job last week talking about the difference between living in the flesh, living in the Spirit. And Paul's point there is, you can't live this way. You can't do these things. And you can go back and look at Galatians chapter 5 to see what some of those things are. But bouncing off of that, First Peter, Peter says this in chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. He says, Be obedient children. Don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, there ought to be a change in the way you live between before Christ and after Christ. Before Christ, you lived by your passions. You were ignorant. You didn't know how to live. You didn't know how to please God. Now you're in Christ. You have the Bible. You know how to please God. You're not ignorant anymore. You are not driven by your passions. You're driven by pursuit of purity, pleasing God. He says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. That is a lot to live up to. Peter says, therefore God says, be holy because I am holy. That's pretty heavy. And so, what happens when we're not? Well, we see examples in the New Testament even of um, God purging his righteous people through illness. Um, you're, you're familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It is the passage which talks about uh, the Lord's Supper, communion. 
And in that passage, Paul says this, anyone who eats uh, the bread and drinks the juice, the wine, without discerning the body, he's talking about the body of Christ. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So he says, um, there's a certain element of introspection that you must have before you take communion. And if you don't do that, you could invite judgment on yourself. Of course, God is the one who judges. So he's saying, because you do this in an unwise manner, in an unholy manner, God is judging some of you. And then immediately after that, he says this, this is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. So what we're seeing there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is that God was purging the righteous, the church, the household of God through weakness, through illness, even through illness that led to death because they were living in an unholy manner uh, when it came to communion. That's, that's pretty interesting, don't you think? Um, I, I think it's fascinating um, you wonder how much of that is going on today. If that, if, I mean, has God's nature changed? I don't think it has. This is serious. In James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, it says this, Is anyone among you sick? Okay. He's going to give us some instruction if you're sick. Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, this, is a, this, is, this has been used commonly throughout church history. If you're sick, call for the elders of the church, call for the pastor, call for the deacons, whoever the elders in your church are, and you know, invite them over. They can you know, some people anoint with all other traditions don't, but this is said, you know, this is something that we could do. But I want to connect it to the verse right after this. Listen to what James says immediately following. By the way, could somebody make a comment just to let me know that we're still I'm still live streaming here. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if I'm talking in the wind here. He says right after this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. In other words, he's saying, if, if anybody in, of you is sick, yeah, call for the elders. Let them anoint you with oil. But then also, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Now, what is the implication I think the implication is pretty clear. That if you're sick and you feel like sin, if you if God has laid it on your heart that sin is the cause of your illness, yes, invite some mature men from your church over, have them pray over you. If you want to anoint with oil, do that, and then confess that sin to them, and God will heal you. Now, the implication of that is that there are certain illnesses that happen because of sin. Now, I want to be very, you know, I want to say it again. Not all sickness is God's divine hand of judgment on his people. But I think we must ask ourselves during times of illness, during times like this, and we call ourselves a Christian nation. So why is God allowing this to happen to us? We must ask ourselves if God isn't trying to purge some unholiness out of our lives. So, what good things is God accomplishing through coronavirus and through all um, tribulation in your life? Number one, He is punishing the wicked through it. Number two, He is purging the righteous. Uh, hopefully by now you've noticed that I'm alliterating, so you know another P is coming. Number three, He is preparing His children for home. Preparing His children. I mentioned at the outset that we weren't created to be sick. Genesis 131, at the end of the account of creation, God it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening and morning, a sixth day. It was very good. In other words, there was no imperfection. Um, it, was it was whole. It was whole. There were no holes in it. It was whole. It had integrity. There was no weakness found in it. Did you? And by the way, this just came to me. Did you know the word shalom? A lot of people know the the Hebrew term shalom. It's a greeting um, for Hebrews, for Jews. Um, it means peace. But 
The underlying meaning is integrity, wholeness, wellness. And the implication is that if you are whole uh, before God and others, if you, um, if your person has integrity, if your life has integrity, if it's built well, then you will be at peace. And that's the way God made his creation. God saw everything that he had made and it was very good. We weren't created to be sick. We were created instead to live and experience joy forever. Psalm chapter 16 verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's God's intention for his, all of his creation really. It's sad. It's good, yes, when God punishes the wicked, but it's also sad. Sometimes things that are good can also be sad. And when God punishes the wicked for eternity in hell, that is sad, even though it's good, but that's not his intention in the creation. God's intention is that you experience a fullness of joy and his pleasures forevermore. And so how does God use sickness and illness and troubles and tribulation and migraines and, and all the rest? How does he use those things to prepare his children for home? Well, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, actually, um, in our First John study, we looked at this verse, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these things are not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So just a couple of notes. We've already been over that ground. But he says, don't love, and I'm going to summarize here, don't love the world basically for two reasons. Um, number one, the world, and he means by that the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, part of life, it does not share the character of God. And so if you are a Christian, you should be like God. Therefore, you can't be in love with the world. You shouldn't be. It shouldn't be in your nature. But a second reason is given. And that reason is that the world is passing away. Verse 17, the world and its desires are passing away. And the truth behind that is that we weren't created for this world. We were created for the next. We were created for a perfect world. And so, uh, you know, Jesus said it this way. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. We, we, we looked at this just the other night in our family devotion. He said, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up treasures in heaven. He says, for where your treasure is, your heart's there. There will your heart be also. And so if our treasure, <laughs> if our heart is with the world, then that's where we're laying up our treasure. And if you're living for this world, that's where your heart is. And both Jesus and John say, don't do that. When you love this world, you're loving something that is going to pass away. And so I, I think, let me, just, let me just say this. Maybe this makes sense to you. Perhaps God allows sickness. And you, you know, we, we could talk about coronavirus, but what are you going through? What illness do you bear? What burden do you bear? What sickness um, is troubling you? Maybe you have migraine headaches every day. Maybe you have bad allergies. <laughs> um, maybe you have intestinal problems. Maybe you have heart problems. Maybe you have had strokes. Whatever. Um, maybe God allows these things to remind us that this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. That song takes its 
takes its meaning from 1 John 2.17. This world is passing away. And maybe we shouldn't be laying up treasures in it. Maybe that's what God is trying to do. So, in conclusion, before we sing one final song, we're going to sing It Is Well in a minute. Um, don't be in the first category. If you are in the first category, if you are numbered among the wicked, and I don't say that lightly, um, I used to be numbered among you. I'm still a sinner, but I'm not among the wicked anymore. But maybe some of you are. You must believe the gospel. There is only one way uh, to escape the punishment of God. And by the way, any earthly punishment that God lays on you is just a taste of what is to come. There is no escaping um, the fires of hell. If you're sick, you can take medicine. If you have an illness that requires surgery, you can get out from under that with a surgery, book a good doctor. But there is one thing that no one um, can avoid, and that is eternity. And if you are not in Christ, when you take your last breath and when your heart beats for the last time, you will go to a Christless eternity that is described in the scriptures as a very, very unpleasant place that lasts forever. And so don't continue in that first category. Don't be among the numbers of those who are punished by God. Number two, examine yourselves, saints. If you need to repent of any wicked behavior, if you need to, you know, you, you can confess that sin straight to God, but James 5 also tells us that it might be helpful to confess that sin to somebody else. And um, if you need somebody to confess that to, I'd be happy to help with that. You might have a friend that you could do that as well. But maybe we're sick sometimes because of unconfessed sin. I would say just um, if God is purging um, those of his righteous ones. Maybe we should take stock, take some inventory. And number three, don't resent sickness and pain. It's easy to resent um, sickness. It's easy to resent pain and trials and tribulation. May I recommend that instead of resenting it, instead of putting up with it, grinning your teeth and bearing it, instead allow it Allow God to increase your longing for home, for the next life, through all of these difficult times. So um, I'm going to uh, say a quick prayer, then we're going to sing it as well. Father, we love you, and our prayer is that um, we would allow uh, sickness and illness and pain to do its perfect work in our lives. We, we acknowledge that you are sovereign. We acknowledge that you are good and that through these things, you do good in our lives. Help us to take the necessary steps um, to honor you, even through times like these. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing It Is Well by Horatio Spafford. And my guitar out. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though satan should buffet no trial should come let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless.
this estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not embarred, but the that you joined us today. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, we'll have more updates as the week goes on. Uh, we'll probably be meeting back here again next Sunday. Um, I plan to have my kids sing next Sunday, so hopefully we can make that happen. If you have any recommendations or suggestions for the, uh, for the stream, once again, just let me know, and I'll be happy to make any corrections necessary. For now, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. God bless.